best way to put it. To start, um, what we did, one of the projects was sampling ryegrass across the state. So we, well I say we, um, when you got a lot of grad students, you get, get a lot of work done. And uh, Zach here is one of my grad students, has put a lot of work in, and actually all three of the things I'm going to talk about are projects that he is heading up and taking charge of. Uh, but this one is one that took a lot of work, a lot of time. We drove around the state and uh, sample um, different spots across the state. And you can see here by this one, all these points are points that we sampled. We took one of those big uh, gazetteer maps that you can get by any Walmart or whatnot, and on each page, we, on a 12 mile grid, selected points, and then just drove to those points if there was a wheat field with ryegrass, we collected it. If not, we drove around until we found some. Uh, hopped out, went in the field, clipped heads, put them in a bag, brought them back to Raleigh, dried them down, and then screened them. And we screened them to all of our post-emergence herbicides to see you know, where was our resistance and where did we have any issues. I think next year I might make these a little smaller. I'm trying to make them big enough for everybody to see. Uh, but here, you can see why we don't have Holon as an option. Uh, basically, every point that we sampled was Holon resistant. I think there was just a few that were susceptible. Uh, it's a great herbicide, but we used it so much, we really don't have it as an option anymore. We tested the ALS inhibitors, um, Osprey, um, and Powerflex, and really, when you look at it, you know, the one and the other, they're very similar. A lot of our resistance is down along the South Carolina border, but we do have it spread throughout the state. And really, we didn't realize how much resistance was across that uh, coastal plain area. So that's something we learned from this, as well as how much is really up here. I mean, we knew it was around, but not really uh, the density. And like I said, the power flex is the same. Basically, if you got resistance to one of the ALS herbicides, you got resistance to the other. So um, this showed up a few more up in the northern part of the state, but really uh, we felt that they're pretty interchangeable. That leaves us one last option post-emergence, and that's Axial. It's the newest compound that we have. And you can see there's really four that we picked out. Uh, when we first ran this, the first run had some kids up here around Greensboro, as well as some out in the coastal plain. After we ran it a couple more times and kind of refined the data, those fell out, but we have confirmed the axial resistance through other samples in those regions. What's concerning about this area here is what it leaves us. And you can see those four populations are resistant to everything. And although it's not widespread, where we have resistance to everything, there's a lot of wheat grown here, and it probably won't be long before it starts spreading out. And so once we have resistance to everything post-emergence, we have to go to cultural practices for pre-emergence herbicides. So you can set that down. Save your arms. Um, so what, what can we do? Uh, some of the work we've been doing is looking at some of our pre-planned residual products, uh, some stuff that can go on spike stage uh, once the wheat's up. And you know we've got some good products, it's just we need timely rainfall for it, and we got to get out there before that ryegrass germinates. Something that's, uh, you know, I guess the products I can list off would be Valor, uh, Axiom, Zituum, those would be probably our top three ryegrass type products that are labeled right now. And when you look at it, Valor, you got to put out seven days ahead of planting in a no-till situation. It doesn't, you'd be surprised for it not having ryegrass on the label, how well it does on ryegrass. It gives good suppression. It, I'm not going to say it's going to control it, it's going to take care of all your ryegrass, but it's going to suppress it, it's going to hold it back, give you a little bit of activity. Our other two are ones you have to wait until that wheat has germinated. Zidua, you got to have that coleoptile emerging off of that seed, so it's got to have taken in water and germinated and sprouted a bit. It doesn't have to break the ground, it doesn't have to be spike or one or two true leaves, 
it just has to have started growing so it doesn't pull that herbicide into the seed and cause injury. On lighter soil, we've seen more injury when we've had it out free, where if there's a rain, it pushes it down to that seed. We've seen stand loss and stunting of the plants. I wouldn't say it's really common, but if it happens to you, you're not going to be happy. So stick by the label and play it safe. Axiom is spike stage or later. Um, and the Axiom, you know, you're not going to put it on real late in the season because of the Sencor in there. But Zitua is something that you can apply uh, throughout the season. And something we've seen that's worked well is mixing it with our post products. So putting it out with Osprey, PowerFlex, or Axial if you don't have resistance to those herbicides. You get control of what's up plus residual going forward. My best recommendation if you have ryegrass as a problem and you don't have resistance is use one of these residual products, either pre-plant or after that weed is in the ground and up or at least germinated, and come back with one of the post products to clean up what escapes and alternate those post-emergence products. So if you use Osprey this year, bite the, bull the bullet, pay a little bit more for Axial next year. Rotate them. Because once you lose Osprey or PowerFlex, you're going to regret not rotating them. Because you're stuck with Axial, and that's just a treadmill that's going to run out too. It's a lot like this Palmer problem we're seeing. If you use one product, you're going to lose it. So rotate those where you don't have resistance. If you got ALS resistance, you got to be a lot more vigilant. And I'd say put out, if you're no-till, put out that pre-plant application, come back with something that's spiked, and then use that axial, but put something like Zidua with it uh, to give you control of those late flushes. Uh, because I'm pretty sure the plots we have where we were just at across the road, uh, we've got ALS, you know, so we got Osprey, PowerFlex, and axial <laughs> resistance over there. And once you have that, it's a mess. Uh, oftentimes we just got to mow those fields. That's my best recommendation. Cut it for hay before it seeds out or you know, mow it down, use it as a cover crop. Um, and you don't want to be in that boat once you put your nitrogen to it and you put, you know, especially if you put nitrogen, uh, fungicides or any other inputs. So try to be up front on it. Uh, you guys in this area have a chance, you know, you notice there wasn't as much resistance around here, there's some ALS resistance, but we're not locked into what a lot of the guys a little further south have to do. Um, outside of that, you know, that's really what we have chemically. Nothing really new on the horizon uh, that's a new mode of action or anything. But Zach's been doing some work looking at tillage effects as well as row spacing. And it's a little early to give you guys a definite recommendation there, but in two years of work on each of those, we're seeing some trends. We started the study on the tillage out east on a poorly drained soil, and it really kind of happened um, by happenstance. Uh, I sent him to put out a study, and when he got there, the farmer said, well, I got till ground, I got no till ground, where do you want to pull it? And he, he called me up and said, where should we put it, Wes? And I said, well, you got enough chemical to do both? <laughs> And it wasn't exactly what he was looking for, but uh, we did both, right? He did both. And uh, it turned out to be something that we hadn't even thought of. Where we had tillage out there, the ryegrass population was almost non-existent. We had a lot less ryegrass, the herbicides looked a lot cleaner, and even our non-treated looked really clean. Where it was no-till, that seed wasn't disturbed, we had a lot more uh, ryegrass and our herbicides didn't work quite as well. So we tried it out here. We have a, a spot up there where we did turbo till versus no till. And we're seeing some differences there as well uh, along those same trends. Like I said, we don't know, uh, we haven't done final stand counts of the ryegrass or yields. So I don't want to say, yeah, go pull turbo till everywhere or till the ground. If it doesn't show up on overall plant yield or crop yield or our uh, ryegrass population, it's probably not worth changing what you're doing. But I'm hoping to have that information you know, later this year to pass out. And then the, t uh, the row spacing, we're also looking at uh, crisscrossing, so double plant, narrowing up the rows. And we've done that, this a couple years as well. We've seen higher yields where we've had the narrower row spacing. 
and we've seen some suppression of the ryegrass. Again, we haven't done our final count. This is a lot easier to do it when it's all headed out. Uh, but again, it looks like we have a bit fewer ryegrass for getting there over the rows. Not a, a recommendation yet, but something we're, we're looking to have answers for. And with that, that's pretty much what I had. Do you guys have any questions for me? All right. Glad we have folks stick around. Thank you very much.